Caroline uh, is a senior fellow in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa at present, and she's a member of the board of the Kirsten Center and an officer of the Order of Canada. <laughs> she has had a career in the Canadian International Development Agency, particularly in multilateral affairs, followed by almost a decade in the United Nations, where she worked her magic in humanitarian affairs, peacekeeping, uh, and peace building. She has served abroad in Kenya with the Commonwealth Secretariat, as Canadian High Commissioner in Sri Lanka, as well as in Burundi with the United Nations. At the time that she was in Burundi, she was one of the few, well, and, and, and until today, she has been one of the few women to ever head a UN peacekeeping mission. So this does not mean, as many of you know, that she was heading part of the mission, but she actually had all the different uh, contingents of the mission uh, under her, uh, her command, I guess would be the right word. Um, I think under that time, you were also in some kind of rapport with the gentleman that you're going to introduce you. Maybe you'll tell us about that later. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm starting rumors. <laughs> delegate, she has played an important role in the UN funds and programs and in, in the international financial institutions as a member of a facilitation team for Burundi Peace Progress and as envoy of the UN in Cote d'Ivoire. And she currently also spends her free time as a member of the Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think I have to stand up in order to introduce the right Honorable Joe Clark. And, and Joe, he didn't ask me to do this, but here's his great book, um, How We Lead Canada in a Century of Change. Um, I read it when it first came out, and then when Julio uh, asked me uh, and cleared with Joe that I would do this, I quickly went back and uh, read a, a lot, big chunks of it again, and I can thoroughly recommend it to all of you. Um, I don't think Joe needs a great deal of... Uh, uh, introduction, but he is uh, one of the most treasured politicians, one of the most respected uh, representatives of Canada, domestic and international. He's also a very successful population, a politician, elected eight times and served as leader of the opposition, as prime minister, as foreign minister, as minister of constitutional affairs a whole variety of jobs, um, and when he retired from politics uh, about 10 years ago or so, he didn't stop. He's been extremely active, uh, particularly in areas related to governance at the highest level around the world and elections, and on a member of many boards, but I'll mention two which are of direct relevance to this audience, and one is the McGill Institute for the Study of International Development. So. Uh, he is uh, among his uh, friends and colleagues today. And the Pearson College of the Pacific, uh, one of my own favorites. He's currently very occupied right now as vice chair of the Global Leadership Foundation. And if you don't know what they do, I recommend you Google them. It's a group of former heads of government, former ministers, senior bureaucrats, international personalities who work behind the scenes often. And, provide direct personal advice to heads of government who are experiencing difficulties. So it's a very collegial and very important role that he plays. And my own connection to um, Mr. Clark uh, was, uh, has been on and off over the years, but um, I'll, I'll mention one example, and uh, the most important example professionally, and then one story which may or may not be apocryphal, so if it's not true, Joe, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, uh, I was uh, managing Canada's uh, relations with the international financial institutions at one point in my later years in CETA, and in those days, although we had a minister for international cooperation, and I was dying this morning to ask Minister Parody if he noticed how many of his predecessors had very short shelf lives. <laughs> but because uh, the Minister of Secretary of State for External Affairs, as he was called at the time, was the governor for Canada and the regional development banks, it meant that I had the luck amongst all my peers in CETA to report directly to Mr. Clark. And it was a pleasure to work with someone who had 
and so much interest, so much knowledge, and so much vision, and so much respect for his bureaucratic colleagues. So thank you for that. If I never thanked you for that, let me thank you for that now. The story, which may or may not be apocryphal, happened in 1973, when Mr. Clark, as a newly minted prime minister, went to Zambia for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting and chatting with Kenneth Kaunda. And of course, his predecessor, Mr. Trudeau, was great friends with Julius Nereri and Kenneth Kaunda and all these guys, and well known. And after a day or two, the story I heard is that Kaunda came out to him and said, you don't sound all that different from the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe, to his credit, said, I represent the same people. <laughs> uh, the part, look, that you were with us at this hour. <laughs> okay, it's your turn. Okay, my turn. <laughs> and then we'll, Joe and I will have a bit of a conversation and then we'll open, open the mic. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That introduction reminds me of two comments. One, uh, you heard her say, uh, telling a story about me, that uh, if it wasn't true, I should shut up. Uh, I recall that practice. Uh, that's uh, Carolyn as I remember her. <laughs> the other thing that struck me on the sort of mechanical side as you were setting up here, it's really, I guess, a testament to my charisma. Uh, but, uh, someone who was appearing on a platform with me has to get twice switched on. Je suis heureux d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Je dois dire que le livre est disponible aussi en français. C'est Agir de concert, le Canada dans un monde en mouvement. Je n'ai pas les copies ici, but we can we can certainly make them available. I also, uh, in my uh, Alberta fashion, speak French. Uh, in fact, so fluently that once years ago, the Devoir wrote an editorial comparing me to the other Trudeau, uh, <laughs> saying, I'll give you the English translation. Uh, Mr. Clark is much more effective in French than Mr. Trudeau. <laughs> <laughs> he uses shorter sentences. <laughs> But I also speak considerably slowly and sometimes not quite as clear as I can deliver these remarks in, uh, in English. I'm very pleased to be with you, uh, and that's not just a formality. Uh, I'm happy at the response that my book seems to be generating across the country. And I think that uh, I was in a unique position to raise some issues that perhaps others couldn't have, and done that in a way that may well uh, cause some important debates to begin. But I'm very much aware that uh, in many ways, I stand, I look at this from a distance. I can make some suggestions about what might be done. You are the kind of people, the work you do is the kind of work uh, that tries to indicate how we might do that. And I think that the real challenge for all of us now is to try to take some of these ideas on which there is some consensus, whether in government as well, or whether outside government, or whether with both, and try to talk about uh, how we can how we might move together, move forward together. I recount a, book, a story in my book that I'm going to repeat here because it makes a point that I think is important. I had the privilege for six terms, uh, six, six sessions, seven, I guess, uh, to attend the, uh, the, the dialogue conference of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations uh, each year. ASEAN was really the first of the multilateral organizations in Asia, an interesting uh, phenomenon about it. It was very cautious at the beginning. I know from current reports it's still being very cautious on some questions. But it had this wonderful uh, frankness when it met, and it invited so-called dialogue partners, Canada's uh, among others, uh, to be with them for the meetings. Uh, we met each year, and there were then six dialogue, uh, six members of ASEAN. Uh, in my six years, I met in the uh, nations of each one of them. And so I decided, uh, in my seventh year as foreign minister, that I would invite them back to Canada for a special uh, meeting to talk about uh, what we might be doing together. And naturally, I chose my constituency of Jasper, Alberta, to uh, 
hold the conference, nobody objected. I told the ASEAN foreign ministers they should bring their, their golf clubs and golf balls because it was Canadian Thanksgiving. And I knew that the essential attribute to being a successful diplomat in Southeast Asia is golf. So I had asked them to do this. We arrived in Calgary on Alberta Thanksgiving. Of course, uh, there was a heavy, heavy snowstorm. <laughs> The planes would not land in him on the way to Jasper, but miraculously, it being Alberta, the highway was open. And so we went up to Banff and we chartered a bus, a Brewster bus, and took the bus all the way up to the Columbia Ice Field, uh, where suddenly the snow began to fall. And I was a little worried about my Southeast Asian colleagues, so I turned particularly to the uh, Foreign Minister Brunei, who just happened to be the younger brother of the Sultan. And I said, Your Royal Highness, you may not have seen snow before. And the late Ali Alatas, uh, then the foreign minister of Indonesia, piped up, His Royal Highness has never been in a bus before. <laughs> now the point of that is that uh, all of us have buses that we've not been in before. We see the world uh, from our own perspective, from the confines of our own experience. And no matter how hard we try, uh, that uh, remains the case. It's certainly a, a driving force. And one of the great challenges now is to try, the world, try to see much more of the world, many more of the issues, in ways different from those that we've followed before. I hope that the book I have written will turn out to have three qualities. I intended this. First, I want it to be an aspirational book. Uh, I want uh, us to talk about what Canada can be doing. Uh, I under fully understand our limitations. I may understand them better than many others in the room, uh, but I think that uh, uh, we should nonetheless, not only because we can make a difference in the world, but being an aspirational country about international policy can make a difference at home. Uh, so I very much believe it should be uh, aspirational. Second, the book is designed to be very Canadian or an international affairs book. I want, to, because I believe that Canada can reflect, can and must reflect and project Canada's distinct assets and identity. Obviously, in, among our assets are the usual trilogy of resource wealth, a strong economy, and a respected military. But we tend to undervalue and underestimate and not assert enough our, 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 our capacity in softer fields, our capacity to manage cultural diversity, and our capacity historically to lead multilateral corporate cooperation. And I want us to focus on those issues as part of our aspiration. And finally, I wanted it to be a forward-looking book, a book that would recognize the profound changes in international relations, and that would urge us all to be wary of this is the chapter title, of the power of previous thinking. It is far too easy for all of us uh, to think of things as uh, they used to be, particularly if we've been in battles to defend uh, some of those concepts or some of those arrangements in earlier times. And we have to constantly uh, be on our guard, not to be caught in ways of, of old thinking, and to take a look at uh, the work, the, not only the way the world is now, but the directions in which it is evolving. There's an assumption often that the changes we're seeing now are, in, are routine in a sense, in that the world always changes. I would argue that many of the changes we're facing now are far more than routine. Some of them are root changes. They are changing uh, quite dramatically and quite profoundly some of the assumptions we've operated with. The premise that I developed as I began to write the book, because writing a book is interesting. You learn things you didn't know before, and uh, I did. Uh, I learned, among other things, about the evolution of Canadian foreign policy, about which I've been fairly badly informed uh, during all my time. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I learned is that Canada really blossomed as a an international, as a country to reckon with internationally, in the immediate aftermath, aftermath of the Second World War, uh, we became an architect of the new world, not the principal architect, but a very important architect. 
And that was for a number of reasons. One, we have won very serious respect uh, in much of the world by the simple valor of our troops in battle. Uh, in that immediate post-war period, uh, the Canadian contribution was one that had won respect around the world. But in addition, most of the other countries that could have done something about reconstructing a new world were in rubble themselves. Much of Europe was. Parts of Asia were. Uh, countries that could have stepped forward and been leading forces in designing a, uh, a new world were simply not able to do that. In addition to those realities, we had the capacity to play a role, and importantly, we had the will uh, to play, play that role. Um, we helped, I believe, in that period, shape the post-war world, and I would argue, I do in my book, that the innovation that was shown in that period, that it, it wasn't simply about peacekeeping. Uh, it was a Canadian who chaired the committee that uh, led to the first international trade organization. Uh, it was a French Canadian, uh, Louis Saint Laurent, who really transformed the, uh, the, em the British Empire into the British Commonwealth. Uh, it was Mr. Pearson, who was one of the three wise men of NATO. It was a Canadian who wrote the Declaration, was the principal author of the Declaration of Human Rights. We played an extraordinary role uh, at that time. And, and I think part of its significance was that it inf inspired and informed six decades of Canadian policy that was international and multilateral and active. And that was not a partisan attitude. That was a characteristic of Canadian foreign policy in its inspiration and in its aspiration under liberal and under progressive conservative governments for six decades. It was far from perfect. It was full of mistakes. You had ministers who didn't know about the evolution of Canadian foreign policy until they got there. But nonetheless, it was a, a very significant role that we had played, and I think it, it drew its origins from uh, that response to a new world uh, in the mid-1940s. We're living in another new world now, and it's a, new, it's a new world that has been changed, caused principally by two major changes, by the fall of two walls. One of those, obviously, was the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, which uh, uh, brought to an end, uh, at the least, an era in which uh, superpowers and a Cold War uh, over ideology had divided the world. The other wall that fell was one that we didn't really know was there until it was penetrated by the insurgent inter internet and caused people who did not know they were confined by what they didn't know uh, to realize that they had things in common with others elsewhere in the world, uh, to take heart from that and to act from that. And the internet, in addition to doing that, of course, brought down, uh, brought into question all sorts of institutions uh, that had benefited from the deference of publics who were looking for leadership and in some senses were prepared to go where the leaders um, uh, pointed them. Some of the consequences of that are that we live now in a world in which the sources of conflict are much less driven by ideology and are much more deeply rooted in culture, rooted in religion, rooted in the question of identity, rooted in tribe. We're living in a world in which power is shifting, not only among nations, which is what is commented upon generally, but also significantly shifting from nation states to non-state actors. And those non-state actors are of various kinds. To use highly sophisticated language, there are the good guys, uh, there are the NGOs, uh, there are uh, those businesses interested in corporate social responsibility, and there are the bad guys. There's organized crime, there's terrorism. Uh, the fact is that these changes, some of these new agents, are extremely influential. Uh, Greenpeace, I would argue, has more influence, has had in the last decade, more influence over public policy than the governments of most nations have. The Gates Foundation is more innovative than most uh, governments have. Uh, most governments are. Much of the work that many of you do in the field is much more effective than it would be if it were occurring under, under government uh, auspices. And sadly, the extent of terrorism is real. 
and we tend to give it more attention and assign it more priority than we do to the equal threat of organized crime, which is, which is very directly related, in my view, to issues having to do with development. Because the countries that are in the sites, the countries that are prey or potential prey to organized crime are very often those that are facing issues of governance or trying to maintain uh, levels either of expectation or of performance uh, that they cannot do on their own and they are consequently subject to some of those changes. What is interesting, and the subject for debate at some future time, is how we change the perception of priorities of governments like Canada's, not just today but generally, that the real issue here has to do with fighting the bad guys rather than working with the good guys. And that's a double-edged that's a double-edged challenge. Uh, we have to be quite realistic, I think, about what are the real challenges from, from international terrorism. What are uh, the real opportunities uh, to deal with, uh, with international crime? And we have to give much more attention to how we can build the kinds of partnerships in which you are also interested and so active in terms of, um, uh, of constructive non-state actors. I mentioned before a couple of other phenomena that are increasingly important. One of them, which is important because it sets so many people loose, one of them is the steady erosion of the authority of former bulwarks of order. Whether those were churches, or governments, or banks, or business, or indeed the sense that by shock at all, military means would prevail. Another is the need I referred to at the beginning, and that is the, the need to rethink our assumptions, including very much assumptions about what is effective development in an age like this. What worked in the past that doesn't work now, and why doesn't it? What worked in the past that might work now, if it were given an honest chance, and how could that be done? What are the no new means that are open to us, particularly in a world uh, affected by, uh, by the, the internet revolution? By the, not, because the internet revolution is more about simply knowing things. It is about the sense of efficacy that occurs when you know things. It's about the, the sense that I'm not alone uh, that, it, that can occur. It's also about the, the degree to which knowledge of other places will create envy in places, uh, in places that are, knowledge of rich places will encourage envy in poor places that will itself lead to, uh, uh, to disorder. Uh, but that, so there are all sorts of opportunities we should be looking for here as to uh, how we might uh, make, take advantage of this in a new approach to, uh, uh, to international development. I use deliberately the phrases hard power and soft power. Some of the, some of the very small minority of public commentators who criticized my book Tiny, tiny. Uh, take issue with that description. Uh, they want me to talk about smart power, uh, which I, perhaps this is a comment on my smartness, I've never really been quite able to understand what smart power is. I think I know what soft power is, I think I know what hard power is, and I'm talking deliberately about those. I want to make the point here particularly that our hard power assets are absolutely critical to Canada. Our economy, a strong economy, our military, indeed a strong relation with our neighbor, the United States. Those are essential elements. But those hard power assets are not as unique as they were before. The classic example of that has to do with Canada's membership in the Group of Seven. How did we become a member of the Group of Seven? Because at the time, when they were opening their gates slightly, we had the seventh largest GDP in the world. We got in on economic credentials. In this modern world, Canada will never again have the seventh largest GDP in the world. And to the degree that that had been an access, our access to influence on a wide range of questions in the past, it will not be again. It's not insignificant, but it, it, that, those kinds of assets will not alone be enough. And instead, we need to look at what we can do with our soft power assets which are highly relevant. And I itemize them as these. First, managing and respecting diversity. If it is the case that so much conflict today is due to differences of culture and religion and of tribe, of where you came from 
uh, than uh, the, the capacity to manage difference. And the capacity which is essential to managing difference, the capacity to respect difference, to respect diversity, is critical in the world. And not only are we, with all of our faults and with all of our modesty, not only are we the best in the world at doing that, we are also broadly recognized as being a society that is better than that, better at that than almost anyone else, than anyone else, uh, I would say. It's, so there is a need and there is a capacity and we have to look at ways in which we can marry that. The second is the, is the very uh, principle, the very central question of our multilateral instinct. Uh, we didn't get this out of textbooks. We acquired our multilateralism by practice. We live in what I used to call the winter half of North America. Uh, we knew we had to rely on others if we were going to get along. And we found in very many ways, uh, ways to do that. And th these were not uh, incidental institutions or attitudes in Canada. They were central to the, to the existence of, uh, of all of us. And we were able to uh, inspire it uh, and practice it internationally. One of the factors I think, I'll come to this in a moment, is that we have not, we do not always insist at being at the head of the table. We find that in many cases, we can be more effective at the side of the table than we're going to be at the head. And we have been quite prepared in cases like refugees in the Middle East to become prominent in an issue that, that was, in the broader scale of things, a niche issue. Not the most important issue, but an issue, an issue which, if not addressed, uh, would inhibit uh, progress on the others. Uh, I think a fundamental aspect of a multilateral instinct is to recognize that there are always circumstances that there are, like in many cases, going to be circumstances when others uh, have to leave. We also have, or we have had, we have to be realistic about this, a record and a reputation as a country, as a people, for fairness, and a reputation for bridging differences. And the, as I don't, as I, as you know better than any other group of Canadians, that reputation for fairness is not simply related to what governments do. It is very much related to what individual Canadians do and what the people with whom you work regularly do. And there have been some spectacular examples of that. I, uh, it, there was an, exa an example which uh, we encountered as a new government in 1979 uh, was the question of the vote people, uh, in which, uh, res with respect to which, the response of Canadians was simply overwhelming. Uh, enough, of course, that one Canada international recognition for our humanitarian uh, expressions. But that was not unique. That keeps recurring, and it is a, an attribute of our being upon which we, uh, uh, we have, to, uh, have to build. I think that those soft power assets are as important and as valuable to us going forward as the asset of our natural resource will. They are both significant assets uh, regarding the future of Canada. But we know about the importance of our resources. We undervalue the importance of some of the factors I've just been uh, talking about. They deserve much more uh, priority today than they're receiving. I've suggested two or three things that we need to look at. Uh, one, I think that while there is this new phenomenon of the real power of non-state actors, we're not very good at working uh, at working with the governments or not, and non-state actors very often are not very good at working with governments. Uh, it seems to me that one of the great advantages of non-state actors as a former minister is that they often have more imagination and flexibility uh, than governments have. But there's one thing they don't have. They don't have the mandate to change the rules. Governments write regulations and write the rules and sign the treaties. So we have to take a look at the phrase I'm using is marrying mandate and imagination. And it's not easy, uh, and it's, it's not infrequent. It happened, many of you are involved in some of those kinds of marriages now, uh, but uh, we need to be focusing on, on that much more broadly. Some NGOs are still reluctant, uh, understandably, they are non-governmental. Uh, that means that there is a sense of contamination about uh, being involved with governments, and that's not theoretical. Uh, that's based upon very hard experience in many cases, and uh, it's not simply a practice that has to be changed. One has to think through what are the dynamics of this factor, and how, uh, how might it be uh, 
how might it be, uh, be changed. I want the country, our country, to begin to look at 21st century alliances. I use that phrase because in the creative work we did after the end of the Second World War, we became involved very directly with alliances with other nation states. Now, they were principally nation states like ours, uh, and they took forms, so they took security forms and economic forms, the OECD, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And we established some very strong partnerships. I think those partnerships remain important. I don't want to suggest we should, should walk away from them or, or ignore them. But I think they suited the circumstances at that time. What kinds of alliances would suit the circumstances of this time? And I don't think they would necessarily be formal alliances, such as a NATO would be. I think that they would simply be practices of working more closely with other countries or with non-state actors who share approaches to issues similar to our own. Uh, I think that, for example, uh, who is good at, at interested in managing conflict? What are other countries which have our capacity to bridge differences? Which are countries which are clearly committed to the idea of multilateralism and making it work? In the book, I've suggested really just a starting list of other countries. The Nordics, obviously. Australia, I think we should be working with more than we have. Uh, I think a country like Ghana would be interesting to work with in terms of, uh, of uh, governance. Indonesia, uh, which has many things in common with us. A huge geography, a very complex population, uh, now a, a commitment to, uh, to democracy, and not inconsequentially in this modern world, the largest Islamic population in the world, by and large a moderate Islamic population. Those are the kinds of partnerships that we should be looking at. And I would welcome your views as to what are other kinds of partnerships? Who are other potential allies? What forms uh, might these, uh, these take? I talked about the negotiating table, not having to be at the, at the front of the table. The phrase I'm using more often is the phrase, leading from beside. You'll all recall the controversy of the US. And there was a question as to whether uh, perhaps Britain and France might lead an international action in Libya. And that was described by some poor guy at the White House uh, as American policy of leading from behind. Or you can imagine how popular that was in the US uh, Senate. And so the phrase was lost. Uh, but I think the phrase leading from beside is not only a more accurate description of the way the world works now, nobody's going to be able to lead consistently from the front as uh, they were before. Uh, but it also, just coincidentally, speaks to a Canadian capacity to lead from beside. That is what we do uh, most well. I want us, I think we should be looking far more emphatically on the question of our role in multilateral organizations. One of the reasons I'm pleased to be here with Gerald is that she has had much more experience directly on hand in the United Nations than I know. But it seems to me that one of the things that it would be sensible for a forward-looking government in Canada to do would be to look at that imperfect engine of the United Nations and to try to identify and draw together a series of countries from various backgrounds who were serious about building on the strengths rather than simply describing the weaknesses of that essential organization. I think that could be a fundamental foreign policy thrust of Canada. Uh, and it would focus on one institution and its, and its family. But it would also, I think, cause us to look again at what use we might make or raise the question, are they no longer in use, of organizations like the Commonwealth, or organizations like the Francophonie. Part of our strength, after all, is that we have a reach into, uh, we are a Western nation, of course, but we are also more than Western because our only colonial tradition was that we were once a colony. Uh, we've not colonized other people. Uh, we're not seen as, as an imperial power. Our, at our, and again, theory aside and practice to the fore, we have very strong relations with countries, some, in many cases fraternal relations, Commonwealth or Francophone relations, with countries that come that are now emerging societies or developing countries. Uh, that has been, I think, that was part of the success, uh, the secret of success in CETA's early days. It was building upon that natural uh, influence uh, that was there. And I think we need to uh, uh, to look at that again. 
I think also it's important that we begin to make the case, not just the argument, but we need to develop evidence for it, that just as investment is key to economic growth in the world, so is social development essential to sustain growth in developing countries, growth and justice and peace. We're all startled, uh, not simply by the actions of Boko Haram, uh, but in, interested by the reaction to it. The answer to Boko Haram, of course, is partly uh, to have international attention raised it, as it has been, but it, and it's, it's a complex issue on the ground. But the real answer to Boko Haram is precisely to, uh, uh, it, it has to do with development issues. It has precisely to do, obviously, with education issues. Uh, but the question of development is the best proof against those kinds of extremist elements taking hold in countries that are understandably desperate. Now, why would we do all of this, Canada? Well, we do it because it is in our interest, emphatically in our interest. One of the things that worries me about our wonderful country is that it is possible, one can even find a lot of evidence of it, that we are becoming far too inward looking. We could easily become a kind of international gated community going out in the morning to earn our wealth in this uh, wonderful world in which we have access, and then coming home at night and shutting the doors. Uh, we have to resist that. We have to anticipate it, and we have to resist that. Not only because it's wrong, but because it's impossible. Uh, you can't have uh, a country like Canada function as a gated community in this world. We have to be, we're going to be part of it, and so we should be part of it in this constructive way as, our possible, as is possible. So it's in our interest. But I would argue it is also in our nature. Um, I spend most of my time now, of course, reading old parliamentary debates. I'm sure most of you do, too. <laughs> <laughs> but just by happenstance the other day, I was reading Sir John A. Macdonald from 1856, one of my favorite parliamentary <laughs> And he was speaking at that time, the phrase is familiar to us all, about the place in Canada of French-speaking natives. And this Scot from Kingston, Ontario, said, treat them as a faction and they will become factious. Uh, I think that that lesson, that spirit, defined what we became as a nation. I'm always struck that the British, after they barely won the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, did not treat the French as losers, but instead uh, respected their linguistic system their legal system, their system of land arrangement, which was critical. Uh, and that was, I think, the birthplace of the idea of, of the tradition of diversity that we have developed uh, in this country. It's very much part of who we are. And if we want to keep it being part of who we are, we have to keep reinforcing it. So John A. McDonald's words, treat them as a faction and they become faction. Uh, that is a role, that's a rule to remember uh, dealing with what, whoever in the world we might regard as a faction, and it is very much a role to revive uh, for Canada. Thank you very much for your attention. I think now if we are both switched on, uh, we can revert to, a, uh, uh, to a, a conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we had a little chat beforehand a day or so ago about all the issues we could raise, and um, Joe obviously jotting them all down, as did I, and so now I'm trying to see if I have any questions left to ask them. Um, you've covered the waterfront beautifully, and I think you've also struck a series of very important chords with this particular audience, the whole concept of uh, mandate, uh, marriage of mandate and innovation is uh, something which this, many of the people here on the NGO side have worked very hard to create. Um, unfortunately, it's looking a little bit more like the divorce than, than a marriage. And um, your comments about uh, hard power and soft power are ones that ring very true to me and also uh, to this particular audience. Um, the difficulty right now in the atmosphere that we are trying to operate in, which many people are hoping will change within the next year or so, um, is that uh, we're 
operating in a system where the hard power option is the one that is chosen, the, the military option or the trade option or the, the heavy economic option. And as you quite rightly say, often these are appropriate. Uh, nobody's trying to say we should stop doing all of these things. But we've lost sight of that element, as you point out. And we've lost sight of working in partnerships. Um, do you have any particular and practical advice for this particular group of people as to how they can operate in that environment in terms of working to get back to uh, a situation which is a situation in which they too define themselves, as you say. And in your book you talk about, uh, you refer to the fact that 85% of Canadians identify themselves as global citizens. Um, we just had a presentation this morning on uh, some research that's been done that, that corroborates that almost virtually 84.6 percent. And uh, French Canadians, English Canadians across the board, young, old, um, and uh, but that's not what we feel is happening on the hill. Um, I'm not asking you to give us a recipe for political change. Um, but uh, is there advice that you could give this group in terms of how they can keep those important issues on the domestic agenda? Well, there are two ways to get out of it. One has to do with the Hill, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, carefully and have to have a limited amount of time. The other is to, uh, has two elements, and it has to do with engaging Canadians directly in important international issues. Many of you are doing that. But I think that, and I say this with absolute uh, unqualified uh, I would suspect that many of you should take a very careful look at how well you are engaging people in your activities who have not been engaged before, but could be. I know from organizations in which I have been part of that it, it is very easy uh, to become insular. And one of the things that's quite interesting about those statistics that you're, you're something that I didn't see, but I don't see. Uh, and that is, if that is the case, why are there not more individuals uh, supporting non-governmental organizations in times other than simply crisis? Response to crisis is relatively easy. It is also, of course, a good indicator. It's an indication of, of people who might become, uh, become involved. But it would be very useful uh, for you, and no doubt some or all of you are doing that, to take a look at what are the limitations of your, of your own uh, capacity to involve uh, people, because here's this huge potential. Here we are, a rich country. I don't have the stats. You heard it this morning. Uh, obviously, people are very busy. I look at my my daughter and her family, and uh, just am amazed at how busy parents are these days. But nonetheless, they, in that case, and in the case of, of most people, they are able to find time to do things they consider to be important. Is it a question of access? Do they think that the things they, they won't, that they might do internationally would not have uh, an impact? Well, many of you could answer the question about the impact it has. Uh, you've seen the impact. So I think that's, that's part of what has to happen. The second is this question of working out partnerships is very important, and I, I won't spend more time on that, but I welcome suggestions as to why that doesn't work, how it might work, what could be done about that. And if not suggestions now, write me. Let me know about that. I'm interested in, in involving. On the question of the government, um, I, uh, the minister was here this morning and um, uh, is here fresh after a, a comment in uh, a deliberate action in Mexico in which there seemed to be a departure from the attitude towards non-government organizations that there had been before. Um, there's a sense in which that does not surprise me. Uh, the part of the governing party with which I am most familiar, which comes from the region I came from, I come from, it came in, in genuine fact from a populist tradition. Uh, and there is, uh, there are strains of populism in that party now. There's no question about it. Uh, there are also, the minister is from a province where there has all, always been uh, a sense of acting together, of organizations acting and it may be that it is his culture uh, that has played a contributing role in whatever it was he said and whatever he's going to do about it. Uh, but it seems to me that it is worth uh, recognizing that there is that tradition there. 
all of you would have, all of your organizations would some, have some allies that are supporters of the government. And probably, rather than simply using those contacts with your allies to criticize a particular action, it might be useful to sit down with some of those people and say, how can we uh, make our organizations a more effective instrument of popular action? Uh, and then let the government know you're doing that. Involve, not the government, involve members of parliament of that party in, uh, in doing that. There's a degree to which some of the questions about uh, prevailing attitudes reach well beyond uh, the, the party in office. And one of the most important, I think, is the investment we put in hard power and the investment we put in soft power. Um, I have not yet had the conversation I hope to have with uh, uh, with the former uh, uh, budget officer of the House of Commons who's now teaching at, uh, at uh, the University of Ottawa. But I think it would be very useful to have someone who knows more about uh, budgets and economics than I do uh, take a look at what we are really spending on security and defense as against what we are really spending on development and call it small d democracy which includes issues of justice and equality at home and abroad. Because I, uh, it is always startling to me that uh, uh, massive expenditures on military matters uh, seem to go through with some controversy but without much hesitation. There are, there are, there are some exceptions to that. Whereas uh, very particular programs uh, that do not cost very much money uh, on the other side uh, are easy to, uh, to take out. And I think we need a new form of accounting about this. I can only ask other people to help on this because this is a, a matter way beyond my, well beyond my own competence or resources. Uh, but I think that uh, that needs to be done. And I, I hope that uh, with the University of Ottawa and others, we may be able to encourage uh, some of that discussion. So I, I, I think there are things that, uh, that can be done. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, one of the points you make in your book, which uh, I think all of us would agree with, um, is the extent to which our international profile reflects our domestic profile. And we use that analogy for in a number of areas, one of which I'll come back to later, and that's the, the missing piece in the dialogue. Well, there's no Canadian dialogue anymore. Um, but uh, I think uh, I'd like to first focus on that uh, aspect in terms of what has happened to our international profile. And that uh, a lot of the questions that people have around the domestic profile and the rather antagonistic relationship that they seem to have with governments is, um, has spilled over into the international scene. You do use the phrase megaphone diplomacy and that morphed into lecture and leave uh, once you hit the podium realm and which was picked up by a lot of people. And um, you used another expression, sliding towards the sidelines. Um, but you also pointed out that when you do go around the world, Canadians are still there. Um, I got zero, zero, zero help from Canada on my UN peacekeeping mission. No military, no development, no political help, nothing. I came several times to Ottawa and uh, now um, uh, but, if I looked at my mission, because Canadians were international and bilingual, um, on the civilian side, my second largest number of a national group were Canadians. I have hundreds of Canadians on staff at Canada. Canadians are in NGOs, they're in the UN, they're in business, they're all over the place. So they haven't lost that. Um, so, it's obvious that Canadians are not happy with the international profile that we have. How can we, how can we come back to uh, a, a, an international profile that is you know, the fairness, the conflict negotiation, the willingness to either lead or to stand aside if necessary, or stand aside if necessary? And how do, how do we get that back? Um, I ask a lot of, you travel a lot, you talk to influential people at international meetings and government leaders, and um, when we do, if we do get a government with a different profile, 
And how repairable is that in, in your experience? Uh, or have you done so much damage that it will be very difficult to get back onto that stage? Well, first of all, I think it is quite repairable. Uh, the, single, the most serious exception is in the Middle East. Uh, but I think elsewhere in the world, the reputation of Canada is very deep in the trash. And uh, it's going to take a lot to change it. Now, I think it is changing. I don't dispute that at all. But I think that it is, it is quite durable. Our problem, our challenge is uh, that we used to be alone in a lot of, a lot of these activities. Uh, there are now, we shouldn't regard this as a liability. There are now a lot of other countries that are that are as engaged in many ways as we are. We should be partners. But I believe uh, that uh, uh, rather than surprise, there would be a sense of relief uh, in the in the world if we came back to that uh, uh, that activist uh, that activist stance. The Middle East is particularly difficult, not simply because it is such uh, an inflammable part of the world, but also because. The issues that are established there are not simply Middle Eastern issues. Uh, they have to do very much with uh, cultural divisions, including potentially cultural divisions at home. Uh, I recall, if my history is correct, that the organization formerly known as the Canadian, as the Council on Christians and Jews, was created uh, in the early days of the first world, of the Second World War, uh, when there was a need to focus attention upon the. Uh, Horrors in in, uh, in in the first, in the Second World War in Europe, um, and it, it played a very important role in creating understanding in the country. We now need some means of addressing the uh, the sense of the likelihood of alienation of Canadian Islamic populations uh, who want this to be their country, want to have things with which they can identify and are also becoming an increasingly large portion of our population. They're the fastest growing cohort of the Canadian population. And I ask myself sometimes, if I were of that faith and tradition uh, and devout in it, uh, what would my attitude be towards the position of the government of Canada uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Middle East? I, so there, there is a domestic reason for us to look at that. But I, I think that uh, I think that we could establish that, uh, that reputation again. I don't know how well known many of you, in the nature of what you do, would know about quite profound cases of Canadians who make a difference internationally. I'm not sure how well that is known, including in your own communities. And again, there may be a problem of talking to exclusively to your choir, uh, singing, and, and I think we need to. We need to look at ways to make uh, uh, make the extent of that uh, that knowledge uh, uh, better known. I'm interested very much in the approach broadly to faith communities. Uh, one of the things that surprises me when I travel internationally, particularly when I'm waiting for a plane, a change of planes in international airports, and I don't have the advantage of anonymity. Uh, if there's another Canadian in uh, three or four hours when I'm waiting for some other plane, they come up to me and they talk to me, which is usually wonderful. Uh, <laughs> but what I learned is how many of them are involved uh, with faith groups. And particularly in Africa, I've encountered how many of them are coming home from uh, a mission of six or seven weeks in some place where they've made quite a difference. And in some cases, they went abroad to preach a particular, uh, to pursue a particular cause relating to, uh, uh, to what we in Canada call the right to choose. Uh, but once they're in place, they suddenly become aware of the other capacity that they have that they could apply. And it seems to me that we should be looking as much, we should be looking very carefully what greater use we could make of some of those, uh, uh, those uh, organizations to involve uh, to credit what they're doing and to involve them in the, in the Canadian uh, uh, in the Canadian imprint internationally. As to the government itself, um, uh, the um, uh, I think we simply have to keep working on it um, and uh, making the case that there are opportunities for capital. 
my stone, yes, it's still turned on, right? Um, put one more question to you and then we must go for the mic. Um, I was very struck by uh, the end of your book where you talk about the disappearance of the national dialogue. And uh, I shouldn't have been because it's obvious, but I really just hadn't thought of it in those terms. I hadn't noticed it. Um, Canada is a country that has had goodness knows how many royal commissions on this, that, and the other. Um, we consider our the success of our multi-layered government system uh, to depend on federal provincial consultations. And uh, in fact, as you say, we see that as a way of managing conflict. I remember when I was High Commissioner for Sri Lanka in the late 80s, people would come up to me and say, we're looking at the Canadian system as a way to solve our problems. <laughs> I said, um, no, we're not going to solve the problem that way. Canada is actually quite a conflictual nation, but we have a lot of conflicts. You can look to us, to our model, as a way of managing the conflicts, because the difference between being civilized and not being civilized, if you quite put it that way, is that you accept that there's conflict in society and you manage it in a non-violent way. You're not going to end conflict, but you're going to manage it in a way that brings everybody under the sense. But you pointed out that, what is it, since in the last six years, there has not, that we haven't had a federal provincial first minister's conference in six or seven years. We haven't had a royal commission, despite the calls for a commission on the disappearance of Aboriginal women. Someone, I think it was, someone pointed out in the papers that we spent $26 million on uh, studying the disappearance of sound on the West Coast, um, which it's an important economic issue. I don't begrudge spending that, but where's the where's the quid pro quo? So, are there ways that we can, through other methods, if the federal government is bound and determined not to have those dialogues? Uh, other ways that we can engender dialogue, uh, which there's a lot of dialogue in my opinions, I'm not saying there isn't, but is there a way to crank it up to a higher, more pan-Canadian, cross-cultural level to the point where members of parliament could not, uh, could not have yes, Especially with an election coming up. Yeah, well, one wants to be careful that it become an election, this not become an election issue of vehicles not become the election issues. But you know, um, I'm a great admirer, as some of you know, of Mr. Pearson's role domestically, as well as internationally. But I remember that when the government of Canada did not take leadership on major federal provincial issues, it was the government of Ontario, under the late Premier Robarts, who convened the Confederation for Tomorrow Conference that brought the, the, the provinces together and, in effect, forced the hand of the Pearson government to undertake many of the major changes. So uh, it's not impossible that there may be some provincial governments that on some issues would be interested in, uh, in generating those kinds of discussions. I think this may be an area in which there could be some real progress made in working with the private sector, the corporate sector, uh, and perhaps on no issue more significantly than on the environmental issue. Because most of the corporate leaders in the country who are involved in the resource industries fully understand that their world has changed. And uh, they, uh, uh, they are, they're not likely to go to barricades, uh, but they may well be prepared to enter into serious discussion about what options might be, uh, be pursued. And they may be pre quite prepared to fund discussions that would be on some of those issues, uh, even if there were a risk that some of the recommendations uh, assailed their interests as they see them now. Uh, and an important element of this, in this new world, is that they know that some of the interests as they see them now uh, are, are unsustainable. Uh, and and I, I think that, that that might be an opportunity. I am a fan of royal commissions. Uh, I know that they can be unproductive. I don't think we can have too many of them. But I, uh, when, I, when we look back at the Canadian social accomplishments uh, that have have been rooted in Royal Commission, our health care scheme, our equalization program, uh, the free trade agreement, a range of other matters uh, began with conversations among Canadians, formal conversations. 
Again, those are easier to start nationally, and I don't think there's a likelihood that the, the present government will do that. But are there other initiatives? Are, and some of the other public institutions are terribly strained. There was a time when universities or a coalition of universities could do this. That may not be practical now, but let's examine that. Let us see if there are some alternate ways to, uh, to begin. And I think many of you, I'm sorry to keep coming back to that, uh, you should be looking at your, your own outreach activities in the communities where you are active uh, to see uh, who might be drawn in uh, to discussions, who among people you, you've been assuming might not be interested, could develop an interest if there were an invitation. Thank you very much indeed, um, but I've been uh, enjoying myself up here, and uh, I think the mics are open, so please come forward with your questions, um, as Mr. Clark is no longer a sitting minister, there's no refusal to answer questions, um, but also in terms of uh, some of the points that have come up, you'll have noticed he's actually asked for suggestions from this group, so uh, make your comments as well as questions and, and make your suggestions. I should say that I never refused to answer questions as a minister. I simply answered them in French. <laughs> <laughs> I never understood what I was saying. I just wanted to say, I mean, it was really great to hear you because you brought certain dimensions that we as professionals who are not political do not touch upon. And that, that's one I want a little more clarification from you. Because we have on the one hand that 85% of Canadians want, etc., with the figure that was given. That is a very old figure. It has remained steady for 30 years. Obviously, that's a very soft position. So, uh, I think politically, we have a strange situation. Then you mentioned the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I personally would like to meet Mr. Gorbachev and would like it revived, if he could. Because that the big worry about the Soviet bloc allowed a focus of the mind. What I think has happened, and this is where I want to hear from you, is that once that went away, you have people who are more focused on very small issues, and certain politicians have found it useful to appeal to smaller sets of issues. You're paying too much money in property taxes. The reason for that is the unionized people. If we get rid of the unionized people, then maybe we will do better. So a lot of the activity is focused at that level. And with the big changes that you're talking about in the world, there's a disconnect between, there's a huge surge of development, young people learning about international development in all the universities across Canada. But that's not affecting the voting. So my question after all this long introduction is, uh, how do we, I mean, how can you bring international issues into this? And I think there were mistakes in the professional. This government, without going into some of the conversations I have had with ministers, they have actually said to me, individuals, that they hate the civil service. I mean, they would really like it to disappear. So it's kind of a strange mindset that certain ministers have. I think it's not a question of dialogue. I think they represent a very different set of forces. That's well, certainly some of them do, but, don't, but not all of them do. And uh, I think that one of the interesting developments, if I can be a political observer for a moment, is that the iron rule uh, of the government is declining now. It's not as controllable an organization as it was before. And I think it would be worth having conversations, particularly with members of parliament or ministers in whom some of you might be disappointed uh, because you had thought they would act as would act differently based on what you knew before. Uh, and I think that uh, many of them, for a variety of reasons, may be more open. But I think there are two. Let's take a look at this large number of Canadians who profess to be interested. I suspect 
apart, apart from busyness, that's not a trivial matter. I suspect that an important question on their minds is, what can I do that makes a difference? Makes a difference? What can I do? Well, and I think that that's, uh, that's an area where a lot of you have evidence. And uh, perhaps what you should be doing in some of the work, and maybe you're doing this, is not simply talking about the challenges you face, but, but focusing more attention upon the successes you realized, and particularly when those have been individual successes that can be traced back to an intervention or to someone like them. So, so people who might be interested in doing something with, with their lives would have a sense that there's an opportunity uh, to, uh, uh, to do this. You know, the, the Boko Haram incident is quite interesting. Uh, we'll see what happens about it, but as with so many public, individual public cases, uh, what has happened is there's been an excitement of interest, the sense, this is wrong, we should do something about it. Well, what can Canadians do other than hold up a sign? And you mentioned to that, uh, you know things they can do. Uh, we have to be looking at ways in which we make that, uh, that better known. The other major problem we're facing now is that we've become an interest group society. Uh, and people do not define themselves as part of a common interest so much as they define themselves as environmentalists or business people or Albertans or some other specific uh, matter. And we have to find ways in which we can, uh, we can reach over that. But that's a, a challenge from uh, previous times. Thank you. And let's not forget... Oh, let's not forget the fact that Mr. Clark has to disappear at 5.30. So, uh, the tighter the questions, the more people can come to the mic. So your challenge, I'm challenging. Uh, yes, Mr. Clark, uh, if you were to give leadership advice to Prime Minister Harper, uh, oh, sorry, Francois Pipal of Mosaic International, um, if you were to give leadership advice to Prime Minister Harper with regards to international development assistance, what would it be? Oh, very precise question. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, he had no exposure, I think, to the effectiveness of development or to issues of development before he became a prime minister. And uh, I cite a passage in the book that really startled me when I, when I, did, when I first came across it in clipping. And that was a statement he made at the end of the conference of the Papa Pomi in Kinshasa when he said, and he was weary, and he was worn out, and I've been in that situation, and, but he was speaking his mind. He said, when we hold these francophone conferences about democracy in the future, we should hold them only in dem democratic countries. Well, that, it, that shows a, a, uh, a, uh, a lack of acquaintance with the impact of example upon uh, the governance question and I just think that he and a lot of his colleagues, and I understand that fully. I mean, I, I came to office as Prime Minister with not much of that kind of knowledge of the world. Uh, I had colleagues, David McDonald, Paul McDonald, others, who had, who had more. And uh, we, and I learned. And so the question is, uh, how can we help him learn uh, about that? In terms of specific matters, that, and another way of answering that would be a more concise way is the uh, we have to find ways to make the case to him that development matters, uh, that it has practical advice, that it results, uh, that it can make economic growth uh, more effective. The, the argument of the government, I think, now is that economic growth will lead to development. Well, development will lead to economic growth. I think to some degree we have to play on their turf. That might be persuasive. Jack with a comment, um, I always quote what I call my favorite book that I haven't actually fully read and, and that I would recommend to any of you if you haven't read it yet to you. And it's uh, The Spirit Level, edited by Will, uh, Williamson Pickett, Will, Willis and Pickett, anyway, Wilson and Pickett, that's it. It's an English uh, book and it's the result of 30 years of research on societies and equality, and it shows over the years the extent to which um, social investment has a far-reaching effect on society, and that 
uh, not just uh, in terms of um, quality of life for, for the populations, but investment in uh, income distribution, education, health, etc. Um, uh, reduces crime, it uh, reduces many of the diseases, it reduces obesity, and what a lot of people need to understand is that it actually makes societies more productive. The productivity is high. Now what it, what it doesn't do is help the future crowds, and uh, therein lies the danger. But the spirit level is a book I would recommend to one of the students. My name is uh, Warren Waters, I'm a private consultant, uh, formerly with the World Bank. Um, I'd like to thank you for uh, mentioning organized crime, um, because in my work I've uh, come to realize that sometimes it's not always that well organized, but there, there are often uh, criminal interests at stake um, over land issues, over development issues, both here and abroad, uh, that are the obstacles that we're facing. Um, and uh, to relate it to what we've just been discussing, um, I don't think that uh, fighting those organized crime or, or, or changing those organized criminal arrangements are entirely a matter of evidence um, and rational um, incentives. Um, sometimes it's a matter of emotions. Uh, sometimes even governments don't respond to evidence, they respond to emotions. And I wondered if you could give some advice on the emotional arguments that are necessary in order to change people's minds um, here and as well as abroad. Very good question. Often it's also a response to desperation. Uh, there aren't other options in, uh, in some of the countries where this uh, arises. Um, here, it seems to me that uh, a government that has focused so much upon what it calls law and order domestically uh, should be open to persuasion on the risks to our open society connected to the world of um, uh, criminal gang activity in the rest of the world. And I'm not suggesting the government of Canada isn't engaged in that now, they are, but I don't think they're engaged with the priority that their domestic rhetoric would suggest uh, coincides with their, uh, with their views. And um, uh, the uh, So I would, I would try to uh, do that. I'm pausing because um, one of the, um, the threat of organized crime is not exclusively the small states, but it is emphatically the small states. And uh, including many small states close to us in the Caribbean, but also small states with which we've been involved historically in Africa at least. And uh, I think it should be a part, uh, an increasing part of our, of our approach to governments in those, uh, governments policies in those countries. Those are the um, views of someone who held high office but is not an authority on these issues. You would probably have more, uh, your, your own remedies would probably be more to the point. Thank you very much. Mr. Clark, th uh, thank you very much for signing uh, your book to me. Uh, I wanted to say, um, I wanted to have you talk a little more about ASEAN and Indonesia. Uh, for seven years, I ran a human rights rule of law project for Canada and Southeast Asia. And we stayed out there because the weather's better. Uh, but the problem right now is that we're not doing very much with ASEAN, and our program with Indonesia isn't moving forward. So I'd appreciate your comments on ASEAN, which is of course 10 countries now, and on Indonesia. Because well, I think it's a missed opportunity is what I'm saying. Let's see if we could take an assignment to all of us all of this. Uh, I know there's a potential there, and I've outlined uh, why I think it's there. What we could do about it, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, uh, but people in this room might, and certainly people that we know might, and perhaps we should all agree that we will try to work out a plan as to what Canada might do, what common ground we might find uh, between ourselves and, uh, uh, and Indonesia. I just want to follow up and say that the things we, we should be doing are the things we've done so well that you talked about, the soft power issues. That's where we're good, that's where we're known, 
And that's where we're expected, and that's what I think we should do. Well, but we should also take account of changes in Indonesia. Uh, and some of those changes in Indonesia are in the hard power field. Uh, and uh, certainly some of them now are in the governance field. Uh, one of the realities is that uh, uh, on the governance question, many of the, the proposals Canadians have made, I've made, others have made, uh, have been framed upon Western democratic systems. And uh, they often do not function in, in other societies. And a country like Indonesia, uh, that not only reflects those other societies, but they're at the beginning of, of, uh, of the non-aligned movement, but also has gone through wrenching changes themselves uh, recently, uh, would have a lot of guidance on what might work and what might not work. But I, I, and I think it would be well, I, I'm serious about saying that I would welcome suggestions I've signed your book and I've got your card. So I'll, I'll follow up with you about um, uh, what we might do on this question of building a, a Canada ASEAN relation. I've spoken to, I don't want to put it in jeopardy, I've spoken to our ambassador to Indonesia who's very interested in this. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I think that that kind, these are the kinds of individual conversations we need to generate. What can we do about specific idea A, B, and C? What can be done to take this off the page and into action? Mr. Plakadir, you can a former Canadian diplomat. Now I'm on the board of the Canadian Hunger Foundation. Here as an individual. Um, the last time we met, I was working with you on democracy and democracy promotion in the world. And I know you have a tremendous interest in that subject. And Tito was very involved in those days. And um, I just wondered, having been to another session here where we talked about the shrinking, in a way, shrinking democratic space here in Canada, democratic dialogue, and I think you alluded to this in your book, what would be your advice to us as individuals as to how we can expand that? I mean, many, many are frightened to speak up because of the need to have money for their organizations, and we all know what's happened to those who have. What would, what would you advise us? Mm -hmm. I'm very worried about the, uh, the chill effect. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's evident. Um, uh, it, it's, it's evident here uh, disproportionately, probably, in Ottawa disproportionately. Um, but uh, it's a problem generally. And I don't. Uh, I don't have a, a quick answer uh, to that. I think the, uh, uh, except to say that I think the more of us, the more people who speak up about particular things, the, the easier it is for others uh, to do the, uh, the same. Um, I think it is worth, uh, and I should say that one of the other things that's happened, even in this time of democratic chill on international uh, activities, there is much more public debate about international issues now than there was five or ten years ago, uh, and it's carried. And there are a lot of students who are who are studying these issues. Uh, but organizations like the Canadian International Council and others are drawing audiences that their equivalents did not draw earlier. So there's some some interest in uh, uh, in engagement, and perhaps there are again going back to many of you in your local groups. Perhaps there are things that you can do to generate that kind of uh, discussion in your own community. There are certainly some domestic issues. I'm not sure they're the right ones for you to start with. There are domestic issues about the Fair Elections Act, about, uh, about other questions. Uh, but a more positive, it's hard to have that debate without the tinge of partisanship. It may be easier to mobilize Canadians on international issues if they thought there were ways in which they could make a difference. Thank you. Brilliant. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Good afternoon. Robert Fox from Oxham. Uh, first, let me thank you for the, your very generous comments on our work, our impact or influence in your book. I very much appreciate that. Um, I want to pick up on really the last comment and, and pursue it because as someone who works in this field, one of the things that we find very, very difficult is sort of the drive-by smear of our sector by the government at this point, where we're characterized as being associated with um, organized crime and terrorists, and uh, really, um, uh, you know, undermining public confidence in a sector where, quite frankly, we don't have enough public confidence.
difference in our efficacy and our legitimacy. And I remember many years ago when you were the Minister of Foreign Affairs, you, I was in meeting with you with a coalition of folk, and you challenged us about our own legitimacy and our own engagement with our own sector. Uh, and so I want to invite you uh, to uh, dig a little deeper in terms of your sense of the critique that we need to assume in terms of our own work and, our, and how we relate to our Canadian constituencies, how we engage them, uh, because uh, as I said, I remember at that time uh, we, were, we were citing what Canadians thought and you were uh, citing your own experience of speaking to Canadians and sort of challenging some of our prejudices and assumptions around that. So in this moment where we find ourselves under attack, uh, it's all the more important that we be looking in the mirror and that we have people who are holding the mirror to us as we reflect on where we truly do have impact and value and where our own self-importance or our own uh, delusions may be um, ill-serving us. Thank you, Robert. Julia will be the last uh, question, by the way, so just get in the room. One of the experiences that I think came up in that discussion uh, was that uh, at the end of the, um, uh, the enormous Canadian response to uh, famine in Ethiopia, uh, I had sought to encourage individual NGOs who had been involved in rousing, raising the response uh, to provide names of their contributors so that CETA, as it then was, as CETA could uh, uh, get information out to them so that their their contribution might not be just one off; it might become a practice. And uh, I was told we we're not giving our names to any government or any political party. And I then suggested that they should give them to your predecessor organization. And uh, they said we're not going to give them to them either. So there is um, for all of the interest of many NGOs, at least at that time, in cooperation as a principle. It was not practiced with potential partners in the field, it seemed to me. I don't know if that is still the case, and I, I can't recall whether that was a matter we discussed at the time. But I think that you want to look at your, at your own, I'm going to talk about two things you need to look at. One, your own practice of cooperating with others. I understand there are limitations to that. Uh, secondly, and I guess it's a variant of this, I think there's a very real question about uh, partnerships with government. And I'm very sensitive, and you were good enough to talk to me about this some time ago. I'm very sensitive about the degree to which uh, non-governmental organizations uh, have reason to, to, to be fearful of being co-opted. Uh, but I, I think also that sometimes gets in the way of, of, accomplish, of, of real accomplishments. We spoke, I think, about, at that time about the work that Oxfam, UK, and Netherlands have done in Indonesia as it has done. Uh, what struck me was not only what a dramatic example that was with Unilever, but how rare it was. It doesn't seem to happen very much, very often. And it seems to me to be something that should, should, be, more, uh, should be done more often. Maybe you should be looking uh, for partnerships beyond your normal partners. Uh, you, are, you, you are cooperative by nature. With whom you should, could you be cooperating more productively uh, that you've not been. Um, I think also it might be worth taking a look. It might be worth testing my thesis uh, that there is imagination you can show on the ground that governments can. And if there is a lot of evidence of that, making that evidence known. Uh, because I think that, that uh, that's a case that appeals sort of logically to everybody. I'm not sure it's as accurate as I claim it is, but I know that so long as the only claim it is me in a book, uh, absent other evidence, it won't change practice. And so I think it may, it may well be, be worth uh, 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 drawing up little lists of, uh, of evidence of that kind. I don't think I'm going to be much more help at this stage, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of the post-2015 context uh, and how that might impact our work and our reality here in Canada. Um, as you, I'm sure, are aware, one of the interesting conversations around that process of defining the new goals or the new framework um, uh, are challenging developed countries mostly uh, to uh, break this us and them, north and south 
they're the ones with the problem with some money uh, dynamics that we saw a lot of in, in the current entities. And to really talk about, you know, what someone called one world goals, where we all have responsibility to look address these issues globally, but also domestically, issues of poverty, uh, violence against women, and what have you. So I think that, for us uh, as Canadians, is really uh, bringing this community, I think, to confront the issues of uh, Native people, Indigenous people in our country, and what, if anything, we can do about that, and how maybe what we've learned, uh, both the good and the bad that we've learned over the many years of doing international work, might help us in, in, in getting involved in, in that agenda. I know there are some organizations that are way ahead uh, of the game that have been doing this, but I think, I, I, I think I'm not wrong in saying most of us have not. I was in a fascinating conversation last week with one of our members um, with their board uh, trying to think of this question because they have received an overwhelming request from their constituents to work on this issue. They're international development practitioners. So we were looking at this and wow, okay, so what are the challenges you know, and the opportunities? having this very strong demand from their supporters and constituencies that they must be looking at addressing this issue. And one thing that came up in that conversation is something that you've alluded to earlier. One of our advantages in working overseas has surely been this soft power, this quality that we haven't colonized anybody. And in that conversation, we all looked at each other and said, well, we have colonized actually one people, and they live in this country. So how will that affect our capacity to, uh, to, to work with these groups uh, in Canada to support, to accompany, to stand by their side, um, and what do we have to rethink and, and relearn, etc. Anyway, it was a very open uh, and interesting, a very challenging um, conversation. So I'd just like to invite you to share your thoughts about that uh, dynamic with us. Thank you. I don't want to anticipate a, an, or, a, an announcement that somebody else is going to make later, but there is, there's an organization, there's a group of about 40 people so far. Uh, all of us, former big shots, uh, who uh, uh, are very much concerned about this issue and have been talking about what we might do, particularly in the context of the report when it comes of the uh, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, remember that its mandate was court-given, uh, not government-given. And uh, so, it has to fight for every bit of space that it, uh, it gets. It's now been given an extension. But it also, and the rest of us, underestimated the problem. And uh, so it has spent a disproportionate amount of its time uh, hearing witnesses, uh, getting at the truth, uh, and not enough time getting at the reconciliation. And what this new group that we have, that is so far informal, that will be, will be announced formally in, uh, I think, sometime in June, is trying to do is provide some focal point that can draw Canadians together who are interested in working on the reconciliation. One of the things that strikes me, going back to my experience as Minister of Constitutional Affairs, was that obviously at that time, uh, addressing questions related to Aboriginal people was a very high item on the agenda of the, of the Charlottetown discussion. And uh, it was because our failure to do that in Beach had led to the end of the Beach Lake Court. And it was a very practical understanding. What was interesting about the, the atmosphere at that time was that there was a, a quite active public interest in those, in those questions. I recall uh, a particular meeting where I was addressing the Ontario Federation of Municipalities, or whatever its name was, in Niagara Falls, I guess in Toronto, but its chair was the former mayor of Niagara Falls, then the mayor. And his spouse was a very active woman who uh, was seated beside me, and I went back to my place after my speech about Aboriginal people. And she said, Mr. Clark, I've never met an Aboriginal person, uh, and I'd like to. How can you help me? I said, certainly I can, and I did. But what was inter two things were interesting. One, uh, I grew up in a community where I met Aboriginal people, as a matter of course. Uh, but, and then I sort of assumed everybody did. But as a matter of fact, I would imagine that as our, with our population changes, both in numbers and in sources of, uh, of origin, fewer and fewer Canadians have a, a much direct experience with, uh, uh, with Aboriginal people. So, uh, but also, this issue we were talking about before, this growing up of barriers, this settling into our own interest groups, uh, the absence of the instinct to have conversations, 
means that uh, the public attitude is not as positive as it is before, was before. I'm very encouraged that some of the, your member groups are asking for that. We will soon have a, a, a door on which they can, uh, uh, they can uh, knock. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to attend any of the, uh, uh, the national events of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But even as someone who know, knew the story, it is absolutely heartrending and shocking uh, to sit and listen to these stories, not simply the stories of what happened, but to, be, but to hear second and third generation. There was a woman in Edmonton the other day who said her grandmother had gone to a residential school, her mother had gone to a residential school, they'd both been taken away at age three or four. She was the first uh, mother in three generations who had been able to raise her own children. Uh, just an extraordinary uh, thing to know that most of us had not known. Now, unfortunately, there have been great crowds at some of the TRC meetings in Edmonton, in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Montreal. Uh, but uh, by and large, they, like most of us, talk for themselves. And we have to find some way to make that story more, uh, uh, more broadly known. I hope that when this initiative arises, it will help. One of the things that we started with was uh, not simply the, the the wound that needs to be healed, the ill that needs to be cured in, in Canada, but also the growing danger that the news about Aboriginal communities was all bad news. Uh, and uh, in fact, on the ground, there's quite a bit of good news, uh, but it never gets reported. It's not on the consciousness. So uh, a meeting of the Ontario Federation of Municipalities might not yield the same kind of interest today that it did 20 or 24, however many years ago that was. And again, that's something we we all have to do. And it is. There's no question. Uh, we we did act in a colonial way at that. I was astounded as a young member of Parliament. Uh, I was on the Indian Affairs Committee by accident because I had three national parks in my riding, and that meant national parks were then part of Indian Affairs. I was astounded by how many of the uh, officials of Diane, whatever it was then called, uh, had come from the British Colonial Service. Uh, and uh, it, I can't believe that was any coincidence now, as I look back on, uh, on what happened. And they were, they were hired because they were good administrators, and they were good, good administrators in dealing with, with people who folks needed help. And uh, it was an effect, it was a version of what happened with schools. And I think that in a, in a lot of cases we, uh, uh, we treated Aboriginal people that way, and now they're out of sight. Uh, they're out of sight of most Canadians, and we have to find some way to, to bring them back into sight of Canadians. Well, I think uh, we have to draw it to a close. Um, first of all, Mr. Clark, I'd like to thank you for uh, accepting the invitation in the first place and uh, uh, being available to meet with this uh, very broad-based group of development professionals and civil society workers and individuals interested in development. Um, I think it's no surprise that your uh, uh, book has uh, had a good reception. And um, listening to you today, and your very frank assessment of some of the problems, and also your very open willingness to, to engage in the dialogue around this, uh, these issues is also very much appreciated. In the so um, thank you very much. And I think many of us would hope to have other occasions to exchange uh, with you, uh, to learn from you and your deep experience, but also uh, to work with you because uh, you're one of the few people who have taken all your deep experience and as you're still forward-looking, uh, looking for solutions and uh, how to serve this, uh, this country of ours. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.